Welcome to Platform. I am Muhammad Kudu Abubakar. The Federal Government's Special Public Works Program aimed at employing 774 youths across the 774 local government areas of Nigeria was openly declared to commence in Abuja on Tuesday, the 5th of January, 2021, by Mr. Festus Keamu, SAM, Minister of State, Labor and Employment. Other ministers are also expected to launch the special public works projects in their respective states in collaboration with their state executive governors. Each of the 774 youths will earn 20,000 Naira monthly for the three months duration of the special public works projects. This edition of Platform examines the scope, implementation and challenges of the project designed to employ 1,000 Nigerians from each of the 774 local government areas. The commencement of the project now appears to have put to rest the initial challenges that resulted in three consecutive postponements of its takeoff. Does that mean that all the issues are now resolved? What is the source or mode of funding? To provide answers to these questions and more, our guest is Mr. Festus Egarewa Adedili Keamu, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Minister of State, Labor and Employment. A lawyer and politician, he was appointed minister in July 2019 after successfully leading the second term campaign of the President Muhammad Buhari as Director of Strategic Communications. Mr. Festus Egarewa Adenili Keamu, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Minister of State, Labor and Pro Employment. Welcome to Platform. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. I was me. going to uh, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. And uh, with me, as usual, is Ruth Aguele on as the panelist. Thank you very much. Once again, uh, a senior advocate of Nigeria and Minister of State, Labor and Employment. Welcome to Platform. Thank you. Let's begin from uh, we saw on Tuesday when you kicked off this special projects program uh, of the federal government. Uh, let's begin from the scope, the, uh, the nature, and what kind of employment uh, you will be creating with these projects. Let's begin from there. Thank you very much. Um, the program is called the Extended Special Public Works Program. Uh, why is it so? Um, it's a program that was originally designed by and approved by President Muhammad Buhari to engage 1,000 youths per local government area to carry out community service, maintenance of public infrastructure. Um, there was a pilot scheme by which we test run the system to see how effective that kind of program would be. That pilot scheme was approved late in 2019 but implemented, uh, we started implementation on February 2020. It before was rough for three months before Corona caught up with us. Mm -hmm. And so we couldn't complete the, uh, the, the first, the pilot scheme. Mm -hmm. But it took off well. And when the, when in the how Corona, many states did you in the eight pilot? states, yeah. eight states and five local governments in those, so it was not even all the local governments in, in those state. eight states. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, when Corona came, and then the ravaging effects, uh, social economic effects of uh, COVID-19, the government developed what they call the Economic Sustainability Plan. Because you can see that the COVID-19 destroyed virtually all our economic plan under the 2020, original 2020 budget. Mm -hmm. So government reacted on time because the president knew immediately that Nigerians would be badly affected, small businesses, and big businesses will be, will be affected. Mm -hmm. The president immediately thought of the very poor Nigerians, those who live on daily wages. For some of, I'm sure you, on the lighter side, you save a lot, and my sister saves a lot, so you won't feel it as much as the very poor. Mm -hmm. But the very poor ones who live on daily wages, who go out every day looking for menial jobs, they call them itinerant workers. Who have to get to work or rather on work that for day. them to eat. You see them at times on the highways. Mm. They come out every morning with shovels and mm. hose. Mm. They look for different work sites to go. Mm. They are called laborers. Mm. 
And so when they work on that day, they don't wait till the end of the week. You have to pay them at the end of that day mm -hmm. for their children to feed. Mm -hmm. These were the people who were immediately affected. Okay, we all were affected. All of us were affected. I'm sure I was more affected than you. <laughs> so, but, but then... Well, coming from an SA and I, I will accept it. <laughs> yeah, but, but then the president mm -hmm. reacted quickly and said, look, listen, mm -hmm. that pilot scheme, we need to extend it now mm -hmm. to cover all the 36, local, uh, 36 states and the FCT and all the 774 local government areas. And that's why they now call it the Extended Special Public Works Program okay. to cover all the local governments and 1,000 Nigerians. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the scope of this work? First of all, we should realize that this is not a, a regular employment in the sense of the Minimum Wage Act. Mm -hmm. So those who have argued that, oh, well, it is below the minimum wage and all of that, should realize that it's not a regular employment of 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock. It's just a social intervention program. Mm -hmm. But then, it is using one stone to kill two beds. As much as it's a social intervention program, they also want the participants to also do some kind of community service, maintenance of public infrastructure, so it will be a win-win situation. It won't be that government just got up and decided to dart money to persons. They want those persons to do some kind of work too, to also benefit society. That is why, you know, uh, they now you know, said in every local government area, government said, the local government should identify what is peculiar to them in terms of public infrastructure. And then engage these 1,000 persons within this period to carry out those, to maintain those public infrastructure, and then they will, be get, they will get paid. Mm -hmm. Now, the scope of the kind of work is not limited to just clearing of um, gutters. Uh, I kept saying that I've seen headlines everywhere saying that, uh, the president has engaged persons to clear gutters. It's not true. Clearing of gutters is just one of several one of kind of jobs that can take place during this time. Some people are, some, some local governments are very agrarian. They may decide that, look, these 1,000 persons want to use them for irrigation so that during this period, before the rains come, and, you know, so that their farms will not go dry, they will dig irrigation, you know, channels into their farms so that they all can enjoy mm -hmm. uh, good uh, products. Mm -hmm. Some local governments where they're very urban, they're not rural. How do you want to clear grass? How do you want to plant uh, uh, farms? Uh, you might mean develop farms. They may use them for traffic control, like Lagos State. Mm. They may use them for traffic control. And on and on and on like that. In fact, some, primary, some, some local governments said, look, they'll provide the paints. But the people will now come and paint. They'll provide the paints and brushes, use them. They'll use them to paint their public buildings, okay. like the local government secretariats, the primary schools that are under this local government, mm. they will maintain them during this period. Mm -hmm. So different kind of needs of the local government. What the local governments will determine what they want to use them for. Mm -hmm. So that is the scope. Mm -hmm. Now, this thing has some kind of historical antecedent. In the past, this type of program has been used to fight poverty in different types, in different countries. Mm -hmm. India employed it for so many years. In fact, that is one of the reasons India got out of being the country with the poorest people in the world before it was India. But it was this kind of program India adopted every dry season. It has to be a dry season program. The reason is that it's difficult to maintain public infrastructure during the rainy season. So it's always a dry season program. In those days during the Great Depression, or when we had fam uh, we had drought in those days where the society, the country had to, countries had to depend uh, mostly on agriculture. When we had drought, governments of those days, they used, many African countries, they used to now gather these farmers who depended a lot on farming. And when they could not get their products out because of drought, they engaged them in public infrastructure, in community service for that period of the drought and so that they can survive mm. until the time the rains come back again. So this is, a, it was, it's ILO endorsed in the International Labour Organization and does this kind of program in the past, mm -hmm. in the 80s and the 90s. And so Nigeria studied this model. The president studied this model and decided that it would be good at this time as part of our economic sustainability plan to intervene. And of course, you know that this is just a, a small drop in the entire program the federal government developed to intervene at this time. The entire program is about 2.3 trillion Naira intervention fund for this COVID-19. The immediate one that has to do with palliatives like this and intervention is about 500 billion. The other ones are under the CBN in form of loans to small businesses. So the federal government 
president himself especially was very empathetic in, in this, this period of COVID-19 and decided to intervene decisively. Yeah, this, yeah, this yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought out the issue of uh, funding. Uh, the, we understand it's going to be funded through the COVID-19 intervention fund, which is uh, slated to be a little above or about 60 billion naira. No, it is, it is under the, the COVID-19 budget. So, they say, they, you know, the, the, the federal government had to go back to the National Assembly, the, the executive had to go back to the National Assembly to, to re to re I mean, rework the 2020 budget because COVID made nonsense of that budget. Oil prices dropped to zero, no earnings for three, four months and all of that. So, the whole budget was reworked again. So, there's a COVID-19 budget that will even run till June. It is not the even December budget. Okay. So that COVID-19 budget provided for this. And so they provided for 52 billion. It was originally pro pro proposed to be 60 billion or thereabouts, but the National Assembly cut it down to 52 billion. And most of it are for stipends. It's not, uh, when you hear those figures, it's not a figure for somebody to dip your hand inside, no. Everybody who is a participant are this registered. We engage selected banks. The banks have their BVN. They are, they are biometrics and everything. We have done that. We have worked so hard in the last six months mm. to get to where we are today. So everybody will be paid by bank uh, account. It is not uh, the ones that they pay cash. This is okay. not cash. Okay. So there will be no zero. When I say zero, I mean zero fraud. No, in fact, one person cannot re receive it twice in a month because it will be by BVN. Okay. Um, well, looking at the 1,000 participants from each local government areas. There have been a lot of questions on how the selection process was done. Exactly. Can you bring us to the know? Thank you very much. Now, what we did was that as chairman uh, of the board and, of the and, and maybe as you tag along with that uh, question, you will also consider the little altercations that, uh, or rather disagreement that you had with the National Assembly. No, well, because I they think, were I think, I think we put that behind us. Views. I think we they put that behind us. The review of the selection process. Yes, but, I, but I, we put that behind us. However, you know, it was just a misunderstanding as to where the separation of powers lies, you know. Mm -hmm. Once a budget is passed and execution starts, it mm -hmm. is now the executive. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's you, you are only to appropriate and mm -hmm. the oversight in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, uh, investigation mm -hmm. and all of that. Under mm -hmm. the, but the executive powers, that is why they call it execution. It's mm -hmm. executive powers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so at the end of the day, what we did was that we, we, we tried to work out a system there's a board of the NDE. I am chairman of the board by law. Mm. And under the NDE Act, the minister is part of the NDE. They report to him on a day-to-day -day basis, not a week-to-week -week basis. Mm. And by section 16 of the NDE Act, I am the only one that has the exclusive power to form committees mm. for the NDE. No other person can do those committees. Mm. The, the minister shall be the ones to form committees. So what we did was that we sat down, we still formed an interministerial committee, whatever, we, we, we brought in other ministries, collaborating ministries, to work out a plan for us. Not that they were the ones to implement, no, mm. to work out a plan for us. The president directed that we should do so. So we brought about eight ministries to work out a plan. And what did they plan? They worked, the, 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 the model we adopted was a multi-sectoral model mm. to say, look, first of all, we wanted to, we wanted to localize the selection process. And we did localize the selection process. Because this type of program is unique in the sense that we could not do it by way of uh, online registration. Mm. The target participants, they don't even know what is called online. These laborers. Mm. They don't have access to smartphones or internet. Mm. They don't. And again, the participants must be resident in those local governments. Yep. So if you do it online, you have all kinds of people registering online. Mm. And they will not be res ordinary residents in those local governments. Mm. So we now said, look, local leaders who know these people, but who the people, you know, trust and they have access to, should be the ones to form a committees, committees to, to pick select. these people. All right. Now, some of these people, I don't know them. They are detached from me. We just set parameters. Chairman Christian Association of Nigeria, we wrote to the headquarters, give us the name of all your chairmen of all the states. They gave us. The Muslim uh, Association, mm. give us the name of all your chairmen. They gave us. National Union of Road Transport Workers, give us the uh, market women, uh, NGOs, the most popular and non, you know, NGOs in those states, mm. and all of that. Traditional rulers. If these people are not close to the, the grassroots, who else will be grow close to the grassroots? What of the local government chairman? No, we did not because it would have been unwieldy mm. in that situation. What we did was to 
involved the governor. The governor was part, his representative was part of the committee. In most cases, the governor is in touch with all the local government chairmen. Mm. So, because we said it's going to be a 20 man selection committee, in many states, you have more than 20 local governments, you have more than 30 local governments. Mm. So, a lot of them bring 111, the committee will be unwieldy. Mm. But what the state selection committees did was also set up local government committees too. But you can see that we made it multi sectoral enough. Involving civil different sectors. Group. Civil societies, of course, were there. Okay, okay. We involved three civil societies, two or three or so, in the 20 man selection committee. The, the most popular civil society organizations in those states. Mm. So it was totally dev devoid of me and my influence. These are just, uh, they are not statutory in the sense of the real statute, mm. but statutory in the sense of what we, you know, the parameters we set. And then we asked for nominations from these organizations, they brought their names. And we set up these committees, we said, go ahead and select. We, at this level, could not micromanage your selection process. We have done our best. We are giving people who are religious leaders, traditional rulers, leaders in their own right. And so we left them so at their discretion. Was there any way that you vetted these names that uh, these committees brought to you? We vetted them by the banks. Oh, I see. Because what they, when they brought this, we sent them to the... The president actually is the directed clearly that we should use select banks so that we can share data with these banks. The banks can share data with us. We didn't allow participants to just walk into any bank and they will be all over the place trying to get names so here and there. We said, register this for us, six banks, and give the data back to us. So they now went, at every local government level, they went to take biometrics of everybody. So those who could, uh, who were trying to use two or three names, different names to collect, mm. they flushed them out. Mm. So we now had gaps again a lot in lot some local governments because they, after the, the cleanup, as it were, the biometric registration was a cleanup exercise. You now had some gaps because you had people who used two, three different names. Well, who wanted to collect part of the challenges you faced uh, yes. that led to the initial postponement? Because, for example, initially the project was supposed to take up 1st of October 2020. Yeah, that mm -hmm. one, Not in all honesty, was because the rains were still on. Mm. The rains were still on and the water level was still high in some, men, some places, project sites. And again, there was a late release of the funds. So that, that first postponement was honestly because of weather conditions. So what of the December 8th uh, uh, change of guards that happened at the Na National Director of Employment? That's the prerogative of Mr. President. I don't want to talk about that. Mr. <laughs> President has the right to hire and fire. <laughs> okay, what of the December 14th resolution of the House of Representatives? Did it affect the takeover as well? No, I think, they I think they were urging the president, if you looked at it very well, mm. Because they, they know they don't have powers to stop an execution of a project. Mm. They were all, it's, Mr. President is the chief executive of the country. So they were urging Mr. President to please stop for one or two reasons. But Mr. President had directed that we should go ahead. No, but, but the resolution itself, if, uh, uh, if you read the content, was talking about uh, where to, uh, rather, the funds will come from. For the project, no, no, they no. Were, they were, they were, they were reported to have said that uh, they will prefer uh, the 2021 budget to take care. Of no, no, there was a COVID a budget in place already, oh, and the COVID I budget runs till June. Maybe they were not. Uh, maybe they didn't advise their minds to that. Uh, I see. The COVID budget runs till June. So and the provision is a COVID budget. So now there are no no other issues. Money has been released. Okay, now that money money has, has been released to the agency. So how do you, where do we, where do we stop? So now that the... Equipments have been bought even before a resolution. How do we stop? So, <laughs> Minister, now that the works, you know, the, um, the SPW has been flagged off, obviously work will commence in each local government areas of the country. They have started. They have started. Yes. Now, how would you ensure that, you know, this beneficiary, so to say, uh, you know, doing what they are meant to do? What about monitoring? Good question. Good question. We have monitors at every level of this work. In fact, what we did was to pick among the 1,000 some who could read and write. So we didn't make 1,000 wholly, you know, itinerant workers. We tried to make a reservation of about 100 or 150 in each local government who are young graduates who are still just looking for holiday jobs. Because we had people like, uh, we had institutions like the MBS that said they want some part of the 1,000 to do some work for the MBS this period. Yes, the MB, uh, the National Population Commission, NPC, also came to us and said they need to do some demographic markings mm. ahead of census. Mm. And so, you know, it's an easy thing for mm. them. Mm. So 
that's why the president said collaborate with other agencies mm. who may need the services of these people. Mm. And you can see that we couldn't use itinerant people for the NPC. Mm. So we, 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 we picked out graduates, young graduates who are just unemployed, who want holiday jobs. These are part of the people we're also using for monitoring, who can send us data. We have yeah. developed a yeah, website, interactive website. Supervisors, if you like. They are supervisors. Mm. So we didn't want to go outside the 1,000 to go and pick supervisors elsewhere and then look for money elsewhere, elsewhere. to pay them. Mm. So the fund itself is self-funding to supervise too. Mm. So they get paid from? From the same 20,000. The they are part of the 1,000 persons. Okay, you said something about COVID-19. Um, you know, the, it's part of social intervention program for COVID-19. And we know that the pandemic is still very much around. If, uh, if this program run for just three months, there are a lot of questions to it. It's a very good initiative, very commendable. You talked about how India uses it to tackle poverty, which is a right step in the right direction. After three months, what next? There are about um, different um, options that are before government. The first one is that, of course, private individuals are already keen in everywhere. Many people are coming to say, look, do you have a database of these people already? We need them mm. for construction sites, for different farming initiatives and all of that. So private farms, those big large private farms, oh, once they finish, give us. We have been looking for them before because yeah. there was no database mm -hmm. of this type of laborers. Yeah. You only have database of young graduates and blah, blah, blah. So we have that, that is, but that is not the major one. Government is also thinking that they may migrate them to some huge agricultural program because they are just a ready workforce yeah. that we had never gathered before. So. By th this program also is a program that is also developing a database for laborers. We, we always had database for skilled people, you know, graduates, but there has been no database for just unskilled laborers. This is a database for it. So government is having access to this database and they can call upon them to migrate them to some huge agricultural program. But it's not yet cast in stone. Now, the other one is that government may decide, depending on the success of the program, and the buoyancy of government mm. to extend the three months <laughs> to more well, months or, or to begin to, to do it as an annual event every dry mm. season. Okay. 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 Every dry season, which is what India and Bangladesh and those countries, China, did for so many years. So that you now have, between one dry season and the other, people will have some kind of capital to do some small businesses. Because whether you like it or not, the final exit is that the 16,000 Naira is capital, whether you like it or not, mm. for small businesses. Mm. There are shops in the markets, in the rural, in, market, in, the, in, the, in the villages, small shops in those markets that are not much, worth more than 10,000. I hope you know that. Yes. Those vegetables they sell, those mm. goro, Certainly. goro and all they sell. Certainly. When they work for six, for three months and they gather 60,000, you'll be amazed how they can you know, boost their businesses at that small level. What government is doing is amazing. For the next three months, 40 something billion will be pushed to the very bottom of the economy to inflate the economy at that level. Not at the not the middle class, not the high. But at least it's not going to go to Cameroon mm -hmm. or overseas. It's going to be here. Mm -hmm. Government will push this money to the grassroots and then small businesses will grow. These people will sell and buy, sell and buy. So 46 billion will be in circulation at the at the lowest level. In the next term, uh, yeah, what, what's your that's comment, a big boost for the economy. What's your comment on uh, stakeholders? Uh, first and foremost, most stakeholders have applauded the federal government's initiative, and uh, like the examples of Bangladesh and India you brought, they are aware and they appreciated President Muhammadu Buhari for that, and they are saying that uh, it's capable of facilitating economic recovery and reducing unemployment, uh -huh. but except if it is not politicized. So what assurances will you give us here now that you will, will make sure this project is strictly what it is supposed to be and it is not politicized? That is why we are here where we are. That's why we fought some battles in the last few months to ensure that we try to keep it for all Nigerians. We made sure that different sectors got out of it. We didn't just want to handle over everything to politicians because they are, see there are many Nigerians mm -hmm. who don't have access to political leaders we are 200 million right mm -hmm. how many voted 30 million 30 million voted mm -hmm. so you have 170 million Nigerians who don't who are not interested in the political system out of the 30 million who voted though who be, you know, how many belong to those political parties because we just have ordinary voters who don't belong to who are not card carrying members mm -hmm. 
So you see have a reduced number to maybe 20 million who are card carrying members of political parties. Or, so you now have maybe 10% of the 200 million Nigerians who have access to political leaders. Even those who are card carrying members of political parties, they still don't have access to the leaders, many of them. It's only a few caucuses that have access to the leaders. So bring it down again to perhaps only 3% of 200 million people that have access to political leaders. So if you want to now say, hand it over to political leaders, all of it, how many Nigerians will get? So we try to reserve a large number of these Puto Nigerians. And that's why we brought in sectors that are not political, mm -hmm. religious leaders, union leaders, NGOs. Mm -hmm. We brought them in, select from your churches, from your mosque, and bring them in. And that's what we achieved. Well, did this 15% slot that was there from last year, did it still go to the speculated minister? We did that. We did that. Okay. I, we did that. Because they are part of society. Don't forget that when we are talking about different sectors of society, political leaders are part of those sectors. Mm. They are. They have well, was right. it 15% or 10%? I see. It was about 15 or in total. I see. In total, ministers, governors, and all of that. And national. They, they had the right to, yes, of course. They had the right to nominate people. Not that they impose. They say, okay, I have these people in my constituency, <coughs> and I know that. Because they, they are leaders who, who know these people, but they don't know all the people in their constituency. They should admit that. They don't know everybody in their local government, but they know their followers mm. very well. And they say, look, we know that these are indigent people. We recommend them to you, and we accepted them. Well, it's good that uh, you have already pointed out that this program may be extended, that is uh, bearing in mind the availability of funds. Uh, and uh, and uh, you have already mentioned also that uh, as Minister of State, labor and employment you are also the chairman of the board of nde correct and i'm aware nde already had some statutory projects programs that it does to reduce unemployment to create jobs and what have you so give us a sense of uh, uh what obtains in nde right now as chairman of the board and what you would now advise after this uh special project uh is either extended or not extended? Well, first of all, we want to see how successful the program is. Then we'll make recommendations government. I'm going to write my reports as chairman of board mm. and pass on to the president and allow the president to make up his mind. I'll make, I'll make my recommendations based on the success of the program. For the other programs, we are going to scale them up because of also the pandemic. My sister asked about the continuation of the pandemic and what we may do. Mm -hmm. What we can do if this program is not extended is to make sure that the other programs are still there under the ND. They may not be as expansive and as huge as this one, mm. but the programs are there. The normal programs we use every quarter mm. to support small businesses, to skill up people. There are so many skill acquisition programs under the ND. We are going to intensify them, make sure that we make them more regular and ensure that we get them to the target audience quickly at this time because of um, the pandemic and then give them starter packs. We have programs that also give starter packs to uh, Nigerians to start up small businesses. So we are going to ensure that we scale up those programs in the meantime okay. and um, uh, to ensure that Nigerians uh, uh, benefit from them. Uh, it's good you, uh, you know the NDE um, project has been brought up because it's all part of economic prosperity whichever way we look at it whether the 774,000 you know um, jobs been offered. Um, let's look at the challenges being faced by this um, skills acquisition now, a lot of times we get to see young people get trained and then when they out of the training from the NDE, um, the challenge of sustainability, the challenge of startup capital and all of that, what would you say as the chairman of the board? No, but you know, we have different programs that also give them startup packs. Okay. We do. So in most of the NDE programs, they may not be huge. Those startup packs may not be big, but they are enough for you to start small businesses. We give sewing machines. We give cosmetic uh, uh, parks. We give plumbing materials. We give carpentry materials. You know, I know that these are the something that one man, you know, can use to start to make repairs. Like a whole toolbox for the plumber, we give it. The whole toolbox for the electrician. A whole toolbox for the welder. So that welding box, you know, that normal big welding box. We give them the welding. So once you have trained in welding. You put your number out there. We have a database we are also collating for this, what we have trained. People cannot have access to this database. Say, so look, I did a welder 
around so so and so local government. Do you have one? Say yes, we trained somebody there. That's his number. You call the person from his home. He doesn't need a big shop. From his home, he carries his tool and comes and says, What is wrong? And I repair and then. Yeah, this is what plumbing. obtains abroad. In fact, we want to bring back what they call the dignity of labor mm. into the Nigerian system. Mm. Look, abroad, the highest earners are the people who come and make repairs in your yeah, home. Mm. The electricians, the plumbers, yeah. the carpenters, they are the biggest earners. Mm. For Nigeria, I think we have realized too that the carpenters have left the other people behind. Because you now have furniture makers. Mm. You call themselves furniture makers. They are, mm. they are bigger boys already. Exactly, yeah. So that one, we have realized that one in Nigeria, that furniture is big business. Big business. Yeah. Fashion, we have also realized in Nigeria. Also because we business. have graduates mm. in Nigeria. Graduates, masters holders who have gone into big fashion business. Mm. So maybe the next one we used to push them are the plumbers and the cap. Even you know, carpenter, like I said, they are also furniture makers also now. But there are other people, other small, you know, these um, people who have um, handwork, who are big, and we used to we need to encourage people. Listen, people who stay in offices every day these days, who look for regular employment to start up, you know, after graduating from school. I can sit down here and make a guess. I mean, we are all Nigerians. The average could be anything between seventy to hundred thousand to start up monthly salary. That should be the average. Mm -hmm. Some may pay a bit more, some may be a bit less. Yes. But the average should be between seventy to hundred thousand to start up as a young graduate. Is in most private or public institutions. That is what somebody can earn if you have your handwork in one day. In one day, yeah. Or in one pro one. Uh, yes, one one, one day. One project. One project. Mm. That you can do between two days and they pay you a hundred thousand, you go. Mm. And in a month, you can see what that person can earn. So we need to put that into the mentality of Nigerians that employment we are talking about under the Ministry of Employment, we are not we are not focused on creating opportunities in public institutions and private so, so that we can give letters like this, type letters and say, uh, my, you, you, have been, be you have been employed, mm. start so, so and so. You are put under probation for two years. After that, you'll be confirmed. That's what people are waiting for. <laughs> Ninety percent of our graduates are home, waiting for those letters to arrive. For Christ's sake, they should get out of the homes, go and learn a trade. Have the, that is what the empire is about. I hope you know that the empire trains young graduates in different skills. It doesn't have, it doesn't matter whether you read sociology or philosophy. Go and learn a trade. While you are learning a trade, they give you thirty thousand naira per month for you to stabilize. And after two years, they exit that group. They have piloted you a bit enough to the to the doorstep. Mm. Go out, to go be able out to be on your own. And then a batch B will come. But then some of them have enjoyed the thirty thousand so much. They now say exit. They say they don't want to exit for the next batch. So they started shouting, "Empower, come, must continue." But there's another batch waiting to be trained. But, but with what you have said now, it means um, at the inception of NDE, the graduate employment program was part of the absolutely, and it's still is. It's still there. Uh, with what you have just told us, it means you may have to expand it absolutely to accommodate most of the graduates who have finished NYSC. I agree entirely. Uh, what, what are plans for that? Well, we are waiting for budgetary provisions. Maybe you should help us to also um, <laughs> scream it to high heaven. They should give friend, us more money. Friends. Oh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, you know, it's good you mentioned the Empower project. Yes. You know, I, I just want to borrow a lead, yes. you know, from how the Empower operates. Looking at the 774,000 jobs being created for the next three months. Now, you are looking at the proposition um, to make it an annual program yes. dry seasonal program yes, yes dry, dry season, season program, program. Yeah. now would it be can can you put into consideration now if this set exit or is it going to, are you going to rely on this data that has been collated for this year is it going to be the same set of people for next year or it's going to be so that it can expand you are asking me to make a policy statement sitting down here alone i, sh I would like to consult my board members Okay. On this. No, are you putting it's that? But, but you can give you, you, you If you're putting that into consideration, I, 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 what will likely that, happen? What I, I will say that. I, 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 I would like to have a new set of people. Persons, I would like mm. to have a new set of persons to mm. benefit. Mm. I mean, so that uh, as many Nigerians as possible. So long as we still find people within that class of laborers, of course, at that level. Once we have them, you know, I would like more people to benefit. I would love more people to benefit from the program. So if we can have, have in every local government, that 1,000 can exit and get another 1,000 to benefit. 
then why not? Because you said it yourself, 60,000 Naira is a capital. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Okay. So what about now, let's look at training. If um, some of these young people who don't have any skills, they're just artisans who can just do, you know, menial jobs to just maintain their community infrastructures, what about training for them if they can also be put into consideration to look at some of these NDE programs? You, because you, a lot of people are interested in NDE you, programs, you, but you they don't have access to it. You are, you are just asking one of the most important questions now. I mean, it's also part of the exit strategy. There are so many persons who have now uh, volunteered to train these people. It's only government, okay. not only government. We have companies who, are, who said, look, they have been looking for people to train in certain things. Those who really need to be trained, who need the jobs. They have approached us to say, after three months, it's also and so local government or it's also and so state, give me 300 persons out of your list. So we are going to watch those who are working. The ones who are more hardworking, who have potentials to, to, to acquire skills. We are going to take note of their names and recommend them to the private sector, to those who are approaching us. Then for the NDE too, we cannot mop all of them up. But those who have the potential to, who have expressed their desire to acquire more, you know, more skills, those who are not lazy, we're going to have lazy ones among them. We are also going to recommend them to the core NDE programs to be trained because they are unskilled labor, most of them to be trained to acquire skills and then to, to exit to, to, to be on their own. Honorable Minister, you, you made your name essentially as a human rights activist. And uh, I said- Not, not in government. Not in government. <laughs> and having you in the studio uh, certainly will not allow you go without you commenting on- Putting me on the spot. That, yes, that is, <laughs> not putting you on the spot, but something that is rather very, very, uh, Jermaine now. The Nigerian military has been fighting Boko Haram, insurgency, banditry, uh, Katarosli and what have you for almost a decade now. And surprisingly, the military now is having pressure, not from Nigerian Nigerians or any domestic problem, but external. The International Criminal Court is there, the Amnesty International is there, uh, trying to, if you like, blackmail or dissuade or d make, make the military now to lose focus. If you are outside, even though you are still, you are now in government, but it will be good to hear from you. What are your thoughts? Well, there are rules of engagement everywhere. I don't think it's a difficult situation, difficult um, question. There are rules of engagement all over the world, even in, term, in, in, in times of war. There are civil populace that must be protected. There are rules by which you cannot exceed, you know, the use of force. Uh, use, you cannot use force even in war situations to the civilian population and all of that. So, and the military, I believe they are well trained in that respect too. They are not just a fighting machine sent out to kill anybody within their sight. They know that too. They know that. So, it is just to encourage the military to keep doing what they are doing. We are proud of our military. We are proud of what they are doing. But it's just keep within the rules of engagement. And I think it's not difficult to keep within the rules of engagement. It's not difficult. We should not also cover up a situation where erring officers who go to war front, rape women, kill innocent people, they go scot-free. They must be brought to book. That is the truth of the matter. You will also not like a situation where in your village because there is war, then a soldier has the right to do whatever he likes because there is war. He comes into your house and drags your wife out and goes to rape your wife, there is war. No that person will be brought to book. So this is the point we are making. There are rules of engagement, mm -hmm. and they should stick to those rules of engagement. And we are proud the military has done that so far. For the Nigerian military, I have not seen, you know, blatant, widespread cases of abuse of human rights. I have not seen that. I have not read much of that. They have been, they have been very professional. Our military has been very, very professional. We are proud of that. It's because of them we are sitting down here today. In 2013, 2014, we were all thinking of working out of Abuja. That is the truth. Once insurgency comes into the state capital, the capital the of the capital. country, the seat of power, mm -hmm. you should know that where the, the country is in you know, a situation of near collapse. President Mohammed Buhari pulled this country from the brink of the precipice of collapse. He pulled it back. But listen, the problem with human beings, Nigerians as a whole, is that always, always we have short memories. That's the problem. Time and space you know, 
erodes memories. We were carrying dead bodies, we were carrying flesh and blood on the streets of Wusetu in front of shopping complexes. We were. When last did you hear that? In, 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 in um, stations, bus stations, in Abuja already, bus stations. There were explosions. We were carrying flesh and blood on the ground in the nation's capital. We have short memory as Nigerians. The problem all over the world is that the present government is always worse than the past. That is, that is the problem. And so when the next government comes, it will be worse than the one in the minds of you know, ordinary people on the streets. But on very cold, hard analysis, like we are doing now, they will realize that this government, this government, President Muhammad Bari pulled this country away from the precipice of collapse. So is the FCC and the amnesty justified for putting the Nigerian military on their toes? Well, they, they, have, they have a duty to raise issues. We must say that. That is why they are there. We will not also be happy if there are no watchdogs over um, institutions fighting wars all over the world. We will not be happy about that. There must be some kind of watchdog. Mm -hmm. The only problem we face here, and I must say it very, very honestly, is that most of them have been sucked into local politics. They are not over and above local politics, really, and it is very, very sad. I have seen comments online by some of these organizations getting deep into local politics, supporting one party over the other, and I said, no, it's over. It's finished. I have lost respect for most of them. Their existence was good. The concept of existing, those of nature existing to watchdog over some of these things is very good. But I think we need to change the personnel. We need to change the personnel handling most of these organizations because they are now deep into local opposition politics. Hmm. And if we're talking wars, most times, anytime there is a conflict, women bear the brunt. Yes. Let's take it back to the 774,000 jobs where women, the female gender, given consideration because most of these jobs that they will be engaged in, talking about the 1,000 beneficiaries, will be more of drainages, you know, and maintenance. Did, did, did you hear my speech yesterday in Abuja? Yeah. I, didn't, I don't think... Well, uh, there are so ladies among the beneficiaries. Well, okay. No, when I was appealing, but, but I was she, appealing to the she selection is, people. But she is right. But I, I, know, I was appealing to them. What is the proportion of the well, female gender? I, 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 we did not impose, but we were begging mm. most of them. Because like I said, we didn't want to micromanage the selection process. Mm. We only set the parameters. We were begging them. In my speech yesterday, I said, please select more women. Give women 60-70% of these jobs. You know why? The women are the caregivers. So. Mm. Yes. They are the caregivers. Me and you sitting down here. Well, I don't drink. But some of us, I don't do some that. of us, we go and drink a go go -ro and pan wine <laughs> after the day's job. But the women will tie this money in their wrapper. Yes. Keep it. Save it. Save it. Use it to pay school fees. Use it to, to care for the family. Mm. The men have gone out to play. But the women, I will keep this money. So we have been begging. With apologies to my men folk out there. These are, I'm making a case for women. Give women more of the opportunities. They will use this money more. Is the recruitment but process still on? Because if it's been flagged... No, what we said, I, I said so earlier, okay. that we finished the registration, but there are gaps, some gaps in okay. some, because of the issue of double so, registration. So now, that what you are suggesting is there should be some proactive affirmative action towards the... Uh, the yes, by those, by those who are interested with mm -hmm. selecting. Mm -hmm. We appeal to them to do so. Well... Certainly, we will. She's have here to. fighting for the women for. No, she's right. Because I'm. Only I also support. <laughs> yes, and I support her. <laughs> <laughs> we, we cannot leave this program without talking politics. I mean, someone who was <laughs> director of strategic communications for the All Progressive Congress in 2019. Uh, certainly, we will want to, if you like, uh, pick your brains, look into that crucible. 2023. <laughs> what's happening? Please leave me alone. Let me leave this. <laughs> Let me leave the studio in one piece. <laughs> God owns tomorrow. I'm thinking of today and to discharge my duty as minister. I don't know tomorrow. God, there's a God factor in everything. Let me just tell you that. Mm. I believe there's a God factor in everything. And I think we should take it day to day. 2023 is still far off. So people were applying for 2023. They died in 2020. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> we are talking of 2023. Do you know what I will see next week? Please, I think we should calm down. There's a God factor in everything. We should leave God.
to pilot us. Yeah, At but the right still, moment, we should make um, key decisions. But still, let's talk about strategy. The APC, as a ruling party, uh, is, uh, I think, supposed to do its uh, national convention or convene its national convention in sometime in June 2021? Absolutely, yes. So what are the plans towards... Well, the first is registration of, uh, re-registration of members. Mm. We want to clean up our register. We want to ensure that membership is uh, verified again. Because don't forget that in 2014, 2013, when we came together, it was an amalgam of so mm. many people. And they mm. just... There was no thorough system then. It was... It, what pushed PDP out of power was a movement. It was a party. Mm. APC was a movement. Everybody came together. And that is why you saw... Is it a party You now? have seen people like us. Is it a party It's a proper party now. Oh. We produce the president. <laughs> the movement produced... It was like... It, APC started like the African National Congress. Yes. It was, it was a coalition against bad governance. And so we all came together. And I, look, that is why you will see somebody like me in APC now. They said... They open their flank to civil society organizations, activists, mm. come in, everybody. Mm. Mm. Let's push this for out. Mm. And so some of us joined the, <laughs> joined the, 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 the train mm. and all that. But then, I think after 2015, we began to properly mobilize. We produced the government as a political party. And what we are doing is to re-verify. You know, after that, some people also left. Those who could not, cont who could not uh, keep up with the change agenda mm. and President Muhammad's vision. Those people who left, they thought it was going to be business as usual. Mm. Oh, when President Muhammad will call, oh, yeah, President will come and say, oh, yeah, all of you, divide cake. Mm. Yes. You take this cake. You, mm. ah, this, when they came, they said, this is a different man. Oh. Yeah. And so they all ran away. Mm. And so President Muhammad Buhari has redefined the concept of governance. I have never had respect for anybody. I have worked closely with him now. He has taken key decisions in my presence. And I've never had any respect for anybody before in my life more than I, what I have for him. His vision, his, his integrity, his straightforwardness is second to none. So going forward, we are properly reorganizing the party. But I can tell you one thing, even though I'm not looking into the uh, Oja ball or the, you know. <laughs> the crucible. The crucible. I'm not, the APC will retain power in 2023. I can tell you that for free. It will retain it will retain power in 2023. And uh, we may have our own internal issues here and there. There will be that's normal politics back and forth. But generally, if Nigerians compare what we did in the last eight years or last five, six years to what happened before, Nigerians will be proud of what we've done. In the context of what we will find ourselves, the context and the kind of leadership in President Muhammad Buhari that we produced. But Muhammad Buhari has carried all of us behind his shoulders. Nobody can boast to say, I produced Buhari. It's rather the other way around. Buhari produced all of us. He carried all of us on his back. His integrity, he, the trust Nigerians have for him people, carried us. People rode on his shoulders. Rode on his shoulders to this point. He mm. has carried us on his back to this point. Mm. Now it is for us to fend for ourselves. <laughs> because the Baba is exiting. Baba is exiting in 2023. So we are all trying to fend for ourselves now. It's like when you carry pilot children to graduate level and say, oh yeah. Go and fend for yourself. So we're all trying to fend for ourselves. And we'll do that creditably well. Now let's quickly look at Delta State. There are some, uh, you know, saying, uh, Kermo is also among those gunning. <laughs> no, please. Governor. Like I said, <laughs> <laughs> let me finish my work as minister. <laughs> Whatever God decides tomorrow, I want to go back to my practice of law. If God decides otherwise, so you want I to abandon available. politics? Uh, if God decides otherwise, I'm available. <laughs> but uh, if God does not decide, you know, I'm a senior advocate. I have chambers running as I speak with you. On a lighter note, I still receive alerts. Alerts are coming <laughs> in every day from my, from my different chambers. <laughs> so I will just go back and uh, fit seamlessly to my chambers. But what is your vision in terms of all these policies being implemented to ensure that, you know, the, the nation grow? You know, if we're looking at economic um, prosperity for the nation, which is the whole essence of all these interventions. What do you want to see? How would you ensure, you know, from your point of view, what do you want to see in terms of sustainability? I want to see massive investment in infrastructure. People have been criticizing such intervention programs and saying that, look, they should plug this money into infrastructure. But at the same time, the benefits of infrastructure takes time. I hope you know that. The benefits, they take time to yield fruits. In the meantime, when you are plopping your money into infrastructural development, yes, you will create some jobs, but the very vulnerable may die before the infrastructure is uh, complete. So you may still give them something to sustain themselves. What we are doing is not the all-cure solution. It's not. But it is for momentary sustenance 
until we can develop infrastructure, boost the economy, and get the economy back on the right track. All of this is a result of the rocks that has developed over the years. They don't want us to talk about it. They say, oh, concentrate on the now. But the now has a past, and yeah. we must talk about the past. We're not giving excuses, yeah. but we must situate it with what has happened before. Now, on that note, certainly, as you, using your words, uh, we all rode on President Muhammadu Buhari's shoulders, and now he's exiting. So what do we, is the APC looking at, and what will you advise even other political parties in terms of, to use uh, Ruth's words, sustainability of programs, sustainability of governance beyond 2023? Well, that is why I think it's important for the APC to put its acts together. We are doing so now by registering members, by reorganizing the party. Uh, put its act together to ensure that these policies continue. Because if you have a radical change of government, you, you begin from the scratch all over again. So that's why I think, and I pray that if I'm not God, but I think the APC will retain power. I'm very confident about that. So that these policies can continue. Uh, and you know the path uh, that the president has set the country on, that path can then continue uh, to grow. Mr. Festus Kiamo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Minister of State, Labor and Employment. Nice talking to you. Thank you so much. Special projects me. and other issues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Ruth Aguele, nice you have been here and for all your support. Thank and you. the champion of women's rights. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'll take that as well. In the last uh, 50 minutes, we've been talking about the federal government special public works project in 774 local government areas. And we looked at the scope, the vision, the jobs, the implementation, and challenges. Uh, Mr. Festus Kiamo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Minister of State for Labor and Employment, has said it all, and he said it's a program that he will even propose its extension. That's Platform. I am Muhammad Kudu Abubakar. Thank you for watching. <laughs>